Good morning. Ooh, it's on. on. It's, it's working. working. Wow. If a few people, people are just continuing to trickle in, there probably will be some more coming. I'm just going to wait just a minute to, to really get started, but start off just by saying thank you for spending your Saturday morning here with us. And hopefully you're going to get some good information, not just out of this session, but all of them. Just looking at the, at the agenda, um, there's so many resources here. Um, it's, uh, for some of you, this is, you've probably been to a bunch of these, and, uh, and you, you know the routine. Others, it's your first one. And it can seem a little bit overwhelming, but, but just um, if this is one of your first ones, just realize this is, usually, this is about a third of what it usually is as far as the people that are here, the vendors and exhibitors that are here, the sessions that are live. It is, um, in a normal and a typical world, which hopefully next year will be, it, it's, it is an incredible program. Um, they'll have twice as many breakout sessions um, for you to choose from. There's something about everything here. And so take advantage of it. Um, gather the information. I know that's why you're here. You don't necessarily need me to tell you, but just to reassure you that um, there's so much misinformation out there. And I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about it. In fact, it's on one of my slides that, that a lot of what I do is, is dispel what people have heard, rumors and things that just simply aren't always true. And at least you know that here you're getting it. Um, you, have, you have APD here, you have Social Security, you have ABLE United, you have the source of the information here for many of that. So you can, you can get good, accurate information. And it's, um, sometimes it can feel like you're drinking out of a fire hose uh, instead of a water fountain. It's just coming at you so fast and it's a lot to, to digest. I will mention, though, that I think all the sessions, certainly this one, is being recorded. So that um, if, if for you or for anybody else, if you want to go back later and look at it, um, I don't know the exact details on it, but we know that it's a Family Cafe's website, which has a lot of resources and information. We'll have the links on there probably within a week or two after the, the program is over. So you can always go back and, and relook or listen to something or catch another session that you didn't get to go to because you're here in this one. So take advantage of that and, and share that information with your friends. And, and, and your family, family members and others that you think might want to benefit uh, need, need this information because it's free. You know, you go on the website, it's just, it's, everything is going to be there. And so um, also I'll mention too that my materials, which you've got, um, Kim Marie, my office manager in the back, is helping us as you came in. Um, you, you got my, some materials that go with the presentation today. Um, the PowerPoint also, though, both the materials and the PowerPoint are, are on my web website right now, my law firm website, which is up here. It's just specialneedslawyers.com. And, uh, and so if you want the PowerPoint, you can, everything that's on there is completely free for anybody to take, use, and share. Um, you know, we, we have, um, you know, it's not, I don't put a copyright, I don't tell people they can't reproduce it, they can do everything. And also on there, uh, some of you may have gone to one of my uh, associates in my office, Cole Long, spoke yesterday about special needs trusts, the ABCs and 123s of special needs trusts. His material uh, and PowerPoint is on there, but also not every one of them, but most of every program that I have done over the past at least 10 years, my material and presentation is on there. So this is probably my sixth or seventh, maybe, Family Cafe that I've done, and I've done different topics. And I haven't done this specific one before, but I did one year, um, a couple years ago when we were live, I did... Um, how to prepare for that first meeting with your lawyer. We basically took an hour to talk about how to get the most out of that first meeting because if you're gonna pay for that meeting, you wanna get, you wanna get a lot out of it. You don't wanna get in there and then after an hour or more you walk out and you go, I really don't feel like I, I know a whole lot more than when I started. So kind of how to prepare, where to go to get resources to, to learn, Kind of, I would say the easy stuff, though not all, you know, a lot of it's not easy at all, but, but the basics so that you're not relying on, on this paid professional to tell you things you could find very easily if you know where to go and look for it. So there's a lot of material, everything from legislative updates when I do those for different groups, but um, my family cafe, so there's, there's years worth of, of material and presentation. So today's PowerPoint and set of materials will be on our website, specialneedslawyers.com. So that's me. I'm Travis Fincham. I'm an attorney. Uh, I just realized uh, recently that this year is my 30th year that I started working in this field and in this area. I mean, it's, yeah, 1991. So I started in this area 
as, as, a, as an elder law attorney, which I still technically am, and that's what my certification, my board certification is in, there's not a certification in special needs planning. Well, well I guess 30 years ago, there probably wasn't much of that really out there like there is today. It still is a kind of new area. It's still hard sometimes to find attorneys and, and professionals to help in this area. I think it's growing because certainly the need is there. Um, but um, but I, I, through the years, I've kind of morphed into doing a lot of the younger planning. But so I started doing the elderly and the nursing homes and long-term care planning. Still do a lot of that. But what we realized is that a lot of the programs and benefits and services that are available for our frail elders, maybe in the nursing home, long-term care types of things, are available for younger people with special needs. Your Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, Medicaid waiver programs, a lot of these things. So I, I gradually have started uh, working into that field a little bit, a um, little bit more specialized. And then um, 17 years ago, uh, this past um, April 23rd, is when my life, as many of you have had that experience, when my life changed. So my, my, I had a son already who actually is at college right here in Orlando at UCF. Um, but my daughter came along, and she just turned 17 years old in April, and she has Down syndrome. So people are like, oh, did you get into this because of your daughter? And I said, actually, I was already doing it. Couldn't have happened to a better person, I guess, right? So, but, but like you, probably, um, you know, in some situations like that, when, when that happens, it's, it's which it was a shock for us in the moment which we didn't know. Um, and then when she was born, we're like, oh, boy, we got a lot of learning to do. And, I knew, and even at that time, I said, I don't know enough about the developmental disability community. I had been working with the elders more, and, and I had done some work in the mental illness community through clients of mine as well. So I was, at the time, I was on our local NAMI chapter over in, I'm in Clearwater, is where my office is. I cover the, we cover the whole state, but, but we're basically regionalized in the Tampa Bay area. And so I had already been involved with some of those, but I had to get more. And I had to, had to learn. And I'm still, I still learn today. I mean, everything, every day, and I come to these programs, and I learn from my clients. And so you'll, you're never going to know all of it. But hopefully today, my goal with today is to give you kind of the big picture. You know, Cole yesterday spent an entire hour just on special needs trust and, and some about public benefits. I'm going to be less than 10 minutes on that, because we're going to get the big picture. And then uh, there's other, other great sessions that, that I'm sure you could do. There's a, there were whole sessions on just guardianship and guardian advocacy. I'm going to touch on I have one slide on it. But we're going to try and pull it all together and just try to help you focus and get, and get a feel for it. Because that's what I have a lot of families that just like, I don't know where to start. What do I do first? Um, and it's not a right or wrong with hardly any of it. You just have to figure out what's going to work for you. But you've got to do... What, what you're, you're doing, doing. you, you got to get, get out there and try to figure it out. Because it's not, unfortunately, the information doesn't come to you. Uh, there's, there's nobody who's just feeding it and saying, here's, here's what you, you need to do next, and here's your, you know, we're going to walk you through it. you got to do it yourself, and you got to try to figure it out. And, and you got to look for those resources out there. So that's, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to spend an hour or so. We'll finish right before lunchtime, and I'm going to uh, save some time for questions. Um, I got a bright light in my eyes, so I might not, if you have a question, you raise your hand. I may not see you right at first, so just be patient. Um, again, they're recording this, so I also have to stay in one place. I, I sometimes tend to like to walk around a little, but I need to stay over here because there's a camera. So um, if I don't see you right initially, just you know, wait a little bit more. But I, I do want, I, you know, I want to be mindful that we don't want to get too specific in detail with your specific questions. We have a table here, too. We're also I've been an exhibitor and a sponsor for years. If you want to talk more specifically, I would encourage you to come to the table because I'm, I'm here all day. We'll be here the rest of the day, or at least most of it. So, so for that, but if there's a general question or a clarification that might help the group, um, I'm happy to, to answer questions, too. So. I, I geared this to also, um, I, I've, done, I've done this bait, this similar program a couple of different times recently. Um, I'm part of the Academy of Special Needs Planners, which is a, a relatively new national organization of professionals, it's attorneys, it's also financial advisors, accountants, and a few other in, in the industry that do um, this type of planning. And so my slides, this is from uh, my last presentation that I did with the Academy. So the little logo down at the bottom is the Academy of Special Needs Planners. I'm on their board of directors, on their, I guess, steering committee for programs and, and what we do. But um, 
I did, I did a training, training session um, that's, that's on their website about for staff. So like if you're a law firm and you're hiring a new person and you do this kind of work, what do they need to know? Um, and so I, I took that presentation and just kind of changed it to say, well, it's, they need to know what the families need to know. And they need to understand um, kind of how we function in our, in our office and how we want to approach new clients um, and helping to advise and how it goes. So some of this talks about, you know, how this is what we do in our office. But, but this is, I think, you know, hopefully just things you need to know about if you do meet with an attorney and you do start down this path, how that first meeting should go. And remember, I've got a whole hour-long presentation on preparing for it. So hopefully when the, the family comes in the first time, they, they have a little bit of background information. And if not, it's okay. We're just starting at a, at a lower ground level, and we won't be able to cover as much um, in, in that time. But, but the first thing that we're doing is we're listening to try to understand what the situation is. You know, everybody's different, but there's a lot of similarities. A lot of your concerns that you have are going to be shared by just about every other parent who has a child with special needs, right? Or a family member, or a grandparent, or an aunt, or an uncle. If you, um, you know, everybody's going to be concerned about the now. You know, am I, am I missing something? What resources are out there? What can I, what can I get? What can I do? But also, we're all concerned about what's going to happen when we're gone, right? That's, the, that's probably the biggest concern. If you've got a good handle on the situation today, and, you, uh, and, and you've got a good system, that's great, but what if something happens to you? That's kind of the monkey wrench that throws, throws in there, and, and it can put everybody off. And so we need to plan for that. We need to think about how we're going to um, you know, plan for when we're not here. So we listen to those concerns, and I also have learned that if someone has a really burning question that needs to get answered, you've got to answer that first because everything else, uh, they, we're not listening a lot of times. When we have a concern that we want to address and we have a question, um, we're not taking in more information. We're looking for the answer to that question. So we kind of focus on what are the biggest issues and concerns and try to address them, but we also want to make sure that that the focus is maybe broader than they initially think it is. You know, we come in focused on this individual who is the most vulnerable person that we know, and we're worried about them. We want to make sure they're covered, and we tend to forget about ourselves. And, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that, because estate planning and planning in general, yes, it focuses on the individual with the special needs, but it also focuses on the family and the support system around them. And that's really where probably the bulk of the planning is focused and what we really should be doing. There's only so much we can do for directly for a child with special needs. Now, some, of, some individuals have a very high level of functioning and some have a very low level. And so depending on, on that individual person's capabilities, some of the same things that we'll talk about for mom and dad or grandma and grandpa would also be available for that individual as well, especially once they become an adult. And that's what we're going to certainly talk about. But we're, we're, like I mentioned before, we're going to listen to what their concerns are and, and try to identify if they've got accurate information. And, and like I said, oftentimes we're kind of dispelling. Oh, they, they've told me that this is what's going to happen. I said, well, I don't know who told you, but that's not the case. Here's how it, here's how it really is and how it should work. So we're dispelling those myths and rumors sometimes. Um, but then when we start to focus, we start on what about the caregiver? You know, um, yes, we are going to make sure that, that when you're gone, um, the plan is going to be in place so that to the, to the extent that you can, to the best extent that you can, we're going to um, leave, leave a framework and a structure there to help protect your, your vulnerable family member. But let's back up first and let's talk about you because we're worrying about an individual who's not capable of taking care of themselves. What if you're there too? We've just compounded that problem. What if you become unable to handle or manage your own affairs, therefore you're not going to be managing your own affairs, and you can't manage the other person's affairs either. Oops, and they hit it twice. So I'm not just talking specifically, if you've probably seen that commercial that, about the Aflac duck that says, what happens if you can't work? You know, we're going to give you money. Um, but that's part of it is, so if you are still working and earning money, um, what if you couldn't do that? 
how are you, you going to take care, care of yourself? How are you going to take care of your people that are depending on you? So, and I don't sell financial products and whether people have disability insurance and things like that, but we talk about disability benefits. We talk about Social Security. Um, are you, as the caregiver, um, going to be qualified for Social Security, either when you retire or when you, if and when you become unable to work anymore? Will you be able to get Social Security disability yourself? Uh, and, and so, so we, we talk, talk a little bit about that, but you've probably seen this analogy before. And if you think back the last time you flew, which some of you may have been quite a while ago because we're not traveling too much, but if you remember that flight attendant in the beginning that's, that's directing, you know, how you know, when the oxygen masks deploy, and they say, if you're traveling with small children, what are you supposed to do first? You put the oxygen on yourself, right? Because if you're in crisis and you can't breathe, you can't help someone else who's in crisis and can't breathe. So you put your oxygen, we gotta get you covered first, get you the oxygen mask, and then you can continue to help the others around you. So that's, I think that's a great analogy, and it certainly applies in, in this area. And so let's talk about getting the caregiver covered. And this is just good, basic estate planning from no, no matter the situation, even if you didn't have a family member with special needs, we all need to think about the possibility that we're not going to be able to always make our own decisions. So there are certain documents that you can put in place that address some of those concerns. The, the first ones are medical or health care documents. So this is where you can say, if I'm unable to communicate myself, who I, what I want for care and treatment and to talk to doctors and be able to give consent, those kinds of things. This is who I want that to be. I want to say ahead of time who it should be. Um, there's lots of different names for it. Um, it the, the technical in Florida is it's called a healthcare surrogate document. Um, some states up north call it a proxy, so that somebody kind of step in and stand in your shoes. In Florida, the proxy statute is, is for making medical decisions for a person who has never signed a document. So in Florida, a proxy is in the absence of a document, who are we supposed to listen to for healthcare decisions? And there's a kind of a pecking order, spouse, adult children, down the line, parents, siblings, those kinds of things. So, so there is a little bit of that, but the main thing, the important thing is that you need to direct it yourself. You need to say ahead of time who you'd want it to be, because maybe that next person on that list may not be the person you want to speak for you. So you make all your own decisions while you can. This just says if for some reason you cannot, who you want to do that. And the big thing nowadays is access to medical information because of the privacy laws. You know, we got these HIPAA laws that have come in, and so. We, we are going to experience those for our special needs children as they become an adult, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but we're, again, we're talking about it for ourselves, so that access to our medical information, just as simply by our spouse if we're married, it isn't always easy without these documents, but then we start getting to more collateral, more outside family members, maybe, you know, adult children, siblings, you know, brothers, sisters, those kinds of things, um, they need to have this document in place to be able to have access. That's, that's the big key there. And then the other one is the financial documents. That's a power of attorney. You've probably heard of that. You probably know basically what it is. There is almost no substitute for having a good power of attorney document in place because everything else, when there isn't one, is a distant second and third place. And we're going to talk about that, but again, you handle all of your financial affairs while you can, but if you could not, who's going to step in and do that? Who's going to pay the bills? Not just for you, but for your special needs dependents, the people who, who are there. So having access to that financial information is really critical. And again, even if you're married and you say, well, I, my, you know, my spouse is going to be able to do that, it's not automatic. Just because... This is a big difference in the medical and the financial. In the medical, that pr there's a proxy statute that says, well, if you don't have a document, then this is who you know, we should be listening to. There is no such thing in, a f in the financial world. If your spouse does not have access to it for some reason, whatever needs to be done, it doesn't matter whether they're your spouse or whether it's your total stranger. They have the same exact priority and the same exact access, which is zero. So in some instances, spouses might even need these powers of attorney for each other. 
And there are two examples when that, when that applies in, in many cases. One would be if you own where you live, a home, and if you own it jointly, let's say, between uh, a married couple, neither of those spouses can sell the home or borrow out against the equity, take out an equity line or anything like that by themselves. Both spouses must do that. And, I, and so some of my couples are like, well, I kind of like that idea. That's actually not such a bad thing, right? That, that um, one can't go take out a mortgage on the house without the other one knowing about it. The problem, though, is, is if you want to do something like that because one of them has gotten hurt, incapacitated, disabled, and now we go, oh, I need to move because I maybe need to downsize. I can take care of my spouse or I can take care of my house. I'm gonna choose between the two. Okay, I'm gonna keep my spouse and I'm gonna sell the house. Or maybe I just need to borrow out some equity that we might have in it. You can't do that if the other one cannot sign. So having a power of attorney is critical to be able to do those kinds of things. The other would be financial things that are titled in only one name. And bank accounts can be in one name, they can be in joint names, but retirement accounts, there is no such thing as a joint retirement account. The I in IRA is an individual retirement account. There are no JRAs, joint retirement accounts. Only the worker, him or herself, is the owner of their account, even if they're married. And you, you can make your spouse the beneficiary, but the beneficiary is, well, when they die, come back and we'll give you the money. But until then, you have no ownership, you have no access to it, except through the owner, except through the original contributor. So having a power of attorney for a spouse can be critical. Again, if you need to make changes to that, if something has happened to one, you need to pull money out, you need to start taking required distributions uh, when you reach that age, at age 70 and a half, and you gotta start taking disbursements. And then um, changing the investments, things like that, rolling out a 401k or a 403b or IRA into an IRA or something like that, that's a critical um, document. So again, just having them for spouses is important, but then you'd have a backup, right? We need to have a backup because what if you're the last one here? You know, your spouse has already passed away or you're in a common accident together. Who's going to pay the bills? Who's going to take care of you? And then therefore be able to take care of your dependents, your family members. So again, it's a, and so similar to like what I was talking about, Yes, we focus on these for ourselves, but sometimes for our, our special needs family members, depending on their capabilities, they could sign these documents too. You don't have to have a real high level of understanding to sign a healthcare surrogate document. It could just be, if you were sick and you couldn't talk, would you want your mom or your dad to be able to talk to the doctors for you now that you've turned 18 uh, and you're now an adult? Well, yeah, who else would it be? Of course I'd want my parents. Okay, then sign the document. So I have executed these documents, the healthcare surrogates and powers of attorney. I've had, I've had adults with Down syndrome, I've had adults with autism, all kinds of, of, of specific diagnoses still can have that level of understanding, possibly. Um, not always, you know, and so if the individual can't understand what it is and they're an adult, we'll, we'll talk about it, um, kind of what, what's, what's next, because as a parent, we have the right to handle the medical decisions for our children while they're minors. But the day they turn 18, we don't have that authority anymore. No matter their capabilities. And I, I did this talk at one of our local schools over in Pinellas County, and I had a mother goes, excuse me, you mean to tell me that, that my daughter, who basically lays in bed in a fetal position um, until someone comes and turns her, she's going to make her own medical decisions when she turns 18? And the answer was, no, she's not going to be able to, but the law d presumes that. The law says the day you turn 18, these rights that have been exercised by your parent is now your rights, and one of them is making health care and medical decisions. And so if that person can't make it, we've got to address it. So sometimes they can delegate and they can sign these documents. Depends on the capability. Sometimes they cannot. So don't just think that. And, and because these other documents, like a power of attorney, are considered a preferred alternative to something like guardianship and guardian advocacy, which again, we'll, we'll talk about it in, in one slide. Um, we want to explore that first. And sometimes we try it even when it's a borderline case 
And because we can always go the other route if we need to. We can always go into court if, there's, if, if we still have a problem after we've tried to fix. Did you have a question? The question is, if you already have a guardianship for an adult, uh, an individual over the age of 18, can, can you do one of these? The, the short answer is the individual cannot anymore because that's probably some of the rights that have been removed from the individual. And we'll talk about that. I have a slide that will talk about some of those rights in a guardianship. But once a person is in that guardianship system, it depends because we can limit it. We can only address a few things, and so they can maybe keep some of their civil rights that they get when they turn 18, um, in which case it's called a limited guardianship if you don't delegate all of the rights. But if the right to contract and the right to make your own medical decisions and those things have been removed and given in the guardianship, the individual no longer legally has the authority to sign. But you don't need it then because you've got the power through the guardianship to handle those things. Okay. But yes, once those rights are removed, the individual can't sign. And that's really one of the reasons we do that, right? Because we're concerned they may sign a contract or something that, you know, to go lease a car or to buy something and they don't really have the finances to do it anyway. And now all of a sudden they might be bound by this. It might not be a big deal because there may not be anything that anybody can do. They may not have any money to come back against. But if their right to contract has been removed, they're not liable and responsible if they sign something like that. That's part of the protection for people who are vulnerable and who are going to be subject to influence. So we also, though, have to start off and talk about the programs. And we could talk for a whole hour just about this, this second bullet, Social Security and SSI and Medicare and Medicaid. But early on in our discussion, we definitely need to have um, a good understanding of what these benefits are. And they are so confusing, and the, the names are so similar, Medicare and Medicaid, what's the difference? You know, they're both medical some things, aren't they? There's a big difference in how um, you become eligible for them and what the, um, you know, what you can actually do and have and qualify for one or the other. So we, we talk about, um, about these programs. And just from the big picture today, we need to recognize that there's about five or six different ways you can get a monthly check from Social Security. It's not just you work, 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 and then you get to be a certain age and you retire. That's one, right? But there's lots of other ways we can get a check through that system. We can work, 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 and then boom, we have an accident. We have a medical condition that prevents us from working. And actually, we can start drawing on our Social Security retirement benefits early. We don't have to wait until we turn earliest 62 or full retirement age is about 68 now or wait until we're 70. Um, we can actually start drawing, if we've worked and paid enough into the system, we can start drawing our Social Security while we're still living but unable to work. That's, that's Social Security Disability Insurance, SSDI. When we pay our taxes, and I understand that we don't like paying our taxes. Most of us don't. And in fact, we would probably prefer to pay less um, if we had the choice. And that's okay, too. But realize that when you pay your taxes, yes, you're, you're putting money in the federal system for all the things that, some of the things that we may not like that our government does, but we're also putting money into the system for things like Social Security for us and Medicare for us. So if you ever study that paycheck stub and you see that, crazy person, FICA, on there who takes a bunch of your money, you got to realize that some of that, yes, goes to taxes and it goes to the military, which is good, and other things that we may not necessarily agree with, but some of it goes directly into the Social Security Fund, and some of it goes into the Social Security Disability Trust Fund. So that disability fund is there for us if we can't work. We are, in essence, buying a disability policy from the federal government when we pay our taxes. They don't ever give you a policy, and they don't tell you that very much, but you're buying that. And so therefore, it's there for you, provided you keep paying your premiums, and you keep working, and you don't stop working for a long period of time. And then if you become unable to work, you start getting a check back. And you can get that check for the rest of your life. The other thing that you're putting money into, though, is a similar program for your minor children who are dependent on you, so that if you retire and start drawing Social Security, and if you have a minor child, 
and there's lots of people that that happens to. We kind of call that sometimes the Tony Randall rule. If you remember Tony Randall from The Odd Couple, I think he became a father, and I think he was close to 80 years old. And, uh, and so he was already on Social Security. So minor children automatically get a check if you're retired. They, already, they automatically get a check if you, as the parent, become disabled and can't work anymore. You start getting a check, you trigger a check for your children. That's because that's part of that money you put into the system. And then that check for that child can continue into adulthood if they're disabled, according to Social Security's definition. So when a parent, and it can actually work sometimes with grandparents if they're legally responsible for the children. So I, I, I use the word parent, and that's a very, can be, it's not just a mom or dad. It can be step parents. There's lots of different ways that it can trigger. But if you start getting a Social Security check and you have a dependent, minor or adult child, they can start getting a check too based upon your work history. And the more you put in, the more you get, and the more they get. And if you're getting a check um, because, let's say, because you're retired or you're disabled yourself, you get your full check. It doesn't matter whether they're getting a check, too. You get the same amount you would have gotten otherwise. And then depending on whether there's other people drawing on your Social Security history, if there's only one other person drawing, this person, because you might have a spouse that's drawing, you may have other children. When you have a lot, it starts to dilute a figure. They have to split it. But if it's only one person, they could get 50% of what you get. So if you're getting $1,000 a month in Social Security, they can get $500. If you get $2,000, they can get $1,000. And that can continue for their lifetime. It's called a Disabled Adult Child Benefit, DAC. It's also called Childhood Disability Benefits. They use those terms kind of interchangeably. But that's where a, a child can draw on a parent's work history. And so if the parent is alive and getting a check, it's 50%. If a parent has died, it's 75 percent. So if we're planning and we're budgeting and we're thinking about these kinds of things for our family member, we need to know about these programs because that's money. You know, assuming that Social Security sticks around, right? Way in the back, we got a question. Yeah, the age 22, I don't know in that particular case, but it's interesting. In order to qualify to draw on a parent's work history, your disability has to have existed prior to age 22. So it sounds like somebody was confused and they flipped it around. <clears throat> if, you, if you have a typical child that is 25 years old and is in a motorcycle accident with a traumatic brain injury, they cannot draw on your Social Security because their disability did not exist prior to age 22. If you have a child who's born with a disability or has that same motorcycle accident at age 20, lucky them. Now they can draw on a parent's work history. So I don't know. I think somebody got it flipped around, but the disability has to have occurred prior to 22. But the benefit isn't paid until the, the triggering event, which would maybe be the parent is drawing Social Security or, again, retirement or disability. So, for instance, right now, <clears throat> well, my daughter's 17, but I'm not eligible for Social Security. And so, uh, nor is my wife. And so, our daughter doesn't get any Social Security benefits. <clears throat> if I become disabled, then, then yes, she would, she would be eligible for that. <clears throat> I think that was wrong. That was the wrong answer. I'm sorry, but um, there are, so there is a whole um, profession of attorneys that, that make their entire living just proving Social Security was wrong. They're called Social Security Disability Attorneys. So if you're applying for Social Security and you're trying to get disability and you get denied at the initial level and you hire a lawyer then, they take those cases on a contingency basis, which means that they don't, they don't get paid if they don't win for you. And the only way that they get paid is, is by proving that when Social Security made their initial determination, they were wrong. And they are often wrong, sometimes in the medical evaluation to determine disability, but also, unfortunately, there are thousands of, of Social Security caseworkers. Um, there can be significant turnover, and there can be sometimes insufficient training. So that, that somebody had it backwards in that case. Um, you, you don't have to wait until you're 22 to start drawing. The disability has to have occurred prior to 22. So applying earlier, in fact, applying at 18 or 19 or 20 <clears throat> is easier 
to prove the disability was already there prior to age 22. If you wait until the child is 30 and you have to apply, you still have to go back and prove that the disability was there prior to 22. So save those records, save the IEPs. Um, nowadays, it's not as bad as it, as it once was, where medical records, doctors didn't keep them. They're all paper now. They're all electronic. So it should be a, a little bit easier to go back. But we'll talk about <clears throat> applying as soon as possible so that you can get that person into the pipeline to start the, not just to start the benefits, but to preserve this determination of disability so that later on, when we want to draw on a parent's work history, we're in a better position. Okay, so <clears throat> Okay, the question was if the child is over the age of 18 and then the parent goes on disability, do they be eligible to need a guardianship, things like that. The short answer is the only thing you have to prove is that it's, the child, that it's a dependent child, that their disability occurred prior to age 22, and there's a couple of other, I say minor, but a couple of other technical criteria. They can never have been married. So when you get, when, a, when a, an adult gets married, this goes way back to English common law. You, you basically, you're emancipated. You break the cycle of dependency on your parent because you now may, may, be, a depend, may be dependent on your spouse kind of thing. So if an individual, um, as long as they stay single, and then there's an except, there are exceptions to that rule, but, but basically if they're not married um, and their disability occurred prior to age 22, it doesn't matter how old they are then. They might be 50 years old if the parent is just now retiring at, say, age 70 or something. So it, could trigger, it triggers that benefit. If the person is closer to age 22 when we're applying for that, again, it's easier to document it. But no, you don't have to apply before 22. It can be any age. Just similar to, like, if you want to open an ABLE account, you don't have to be under the age of 26 to open it. You just have to prove that your disability existed prior to age 26. I have sat in my office and helped 50-year-olds open ABLE accounts. And they weren't even around. You know, they've only been around four, five, five or six years now. So these dates and these ages make a big difference. But the age 22 just means that the disability has to have been there before that and you can document it. And you don't have to have a guardianship to apply for Social Security benefits. It can help sometimes because one of the rights, and again, I think it's come up on our next slide, um, is, is to apply for government benefits. That's a right that can be delegated in the, in the guardianship process. But you don't have to, um, to have it because if you go into Social Security and the individual is not capable of making their own application, and certainly if they're not capable of receiving that Social Security check, and utilizing it to their benefit, Social Security will appoint a, a representative payee, a rep payee. Some of you, I'm sure a lot of you are probably rep payees for, for a family member. So Social Security can make their own independent determination that a person can't manage their own finance. Well, not finances. They're only worried about the Social Security check. And then they, um, they can send that check to someone else, and, and that rep, representative payee has to account for it and use it properly. If there is a guardian in place, then the federal agency, Social Security, will defer oftentimes to the state guardian, which because guardianships are handled at the state level, um, and say, okay, well, we'll let the guardian be the representative payee. But interestingly, Social Security doesn't have to do that. They don't have to honor powers of attorney. They don't have to honor guardianship because that's state law stuff. And they're the federal government. And there's something in the Constitution called the Supremacy Clause. And what it says is that federal law is supreme if there's a conflict or an issue with state law. So a lot of times these federal agencies are like, we don't care whether you're power of attorney or not. We have our own little way of doing it. And they don't necessarily care whether you're a guardian or not because they say, well, we already have a, something, a representative payee in place. Um, so there's overlapping similarities and things like that, but you don't have to be a guardian to, um, to apply for Social Security for a person. I see right under the light a hand up. That's a different, yeah, okay, so I haven't even talked about SSI yet, right? I was only, I talked about Social Security, I talked second about retirement, and then I started talking about Social Security disability, SSDI for us. I talked about the disabled adult child benefit, DAC, right? Uh, that's where an adult son or daughter can draw on a parent's work history. Well, what if none of those apply? None of those are available. I'm sorry, yeah.
Yeah, I hope everybody could hear that question. If not, I'll kind of paraphrase. But how about, how about this for an answer? Can you get combinations of any of these checks? The short answer is you can get combinations of a lot of these checks. And you can actually you can get promoted from one to another sometimes, too. Um, and so yeah, yeah, um, the question about the SSI, so what is SSI? SSI is Supplemental Security Income. It is not Social Security. In fact, it has nearly nothing to do with Social Security. It just happened to be that when the program came about in the 60s, they said, we, ha we need to provide a welfare check to people who qualify. And either they can be sick over the age of 65 and, and perfectly fine and just have no money, in which case you can be eligible for this welfare check, or if you're under 65, we're only going to give it to people who are disabled. And so it is a welfare. So they, they, back then they go, well, who do we know that can give a monthly check to people and from the government and do a pretty decent job of it. Well, let's let Social Security do it. So they folded it into the Social Security system, but none of that money you pay in, in, uh, in FICA that goes into the Social Security Disability Fund and the Retirement Fund, none of that goes to the SSI program. This comes out of general revenue. It's the general tax money that you pay that goes to the federal government that they, you know, they allocate to the military and uh, you know, federal employees and all the salaries and stuff. That's, it's, it's a welfare program. So it is a, a monthly check for a person who needs a minimum amount to live on. And so if that's the supplement. It's, it's to bring you up to a, a basic level. Now, it's not very much, and it's not very um, comprehensive, but it's a little bit shy. The maximum right now is $800 a month, 700, and I'm going to answer your question. $794 is the maximum SSI check. And it goes up every year. It's indexed. But... There's lots of, of ways that it gets reduced because it's designed to get you to that level. Well, if you've got income from some other source, like you're working a little bit, not so much that you're not disabled, but you're working a little bit, they're going to reduce that SSI benefit. They also, in the SSI system, they will count someone else's income against you, even though it's not your income. If you're married, they count your spouse's income. If you're a minor child, still have to be disabled, which how do we know when a minor child is disabled? Well, sometimes it's really obvious, and sometimes it's not. We can't tell. Physically, we might not know. So Social Security has to make a determination for minors to say whether they think that that, that condition is going to last into adulthood, because the, the definition of disabled, according to Social Security, is you're unable to engage in what they call substantial gainful activity, SGA. Substantial gainful activity is that you're unable to make a certain amount of money each month. A little bit shy of, of $1,300 a month, like $1,280 or something like that, I think is the figure right now. Because of some medical condition that prevents you from being able to do it. You have a diagnosis or something that prevents you from doing that. And that condition can't just be a, you broke your leg and you're out of work for six months or three months. It's got to be a condition that's either lasted a year or is expected to last a year, or is terminal. So you have a medically identifiable condition that prevents you from making a certain amount of money each month because of this condition that's lasted a year, is expected to last a year in the future, or is terminal. How do we do that for a, a six-month-old, or a five-year-old, or a 15-year-old? We still look at whether they think that condition, once they become an adult, would prevent them from doing that. And if they do, they can say, well, this person could be eligible for SSI, but if they're still a minor, the parent's income counts against them. So you might not be eligible because there's this deeming concept. I'll get to you in a minute. Hang on. Um, and so they look at the parent's resources and they look at the parent's income because this is a welfare program. And so you can still work as a parent. You can still have some, some, some savings, not a lot. And the rules get complicated, but it can trigger that check. But for many of our minors under the age of 18, they're not eligible for it because of the parent's resources. The day they turn 18, they stop counting the parents' resources against them. No more deeming for SSI. So then what we do is we go apply for SSI, hopefully at age 18, and then they can be eligible for this monthly check, and it comes with medical coverage if needed through the Medicaid program. But it's a maximum, and there's rules that go along with it. Okay, that's fine. And so what often happens is, they're not eligible for anything while they're under the age of 18 because the parents have something in the bank and they make too much money. Then at 18, they become eligible. But then what happens down the road when one of those other triggering events, the parent retires, the parent becomes disabled, 
or a parent dies, it can trigger that, uh, that other check for that child. So depending on how much that check is. So in my first example, I said, if, you're, if you make $1,000 in Social Security and your child gets 500, okay, so let's say that that event occurs. You retire and you start drawing and your child now gets $500. Well, that's less than $794, the, the supplemental check, the, the benefit to get you up to that 794. So, you get the 500, and you're still going to get $294 of SSI. In fact, you get $294 plus another 20, because the rules are so complicated, they had to do this. Um, if you're getting a disability check based on a parent's work history, they're not going to count the first $20. Eh, we're not going to count the first 20. So they just basically say, if you get $120, eh, we're not going to count the first 20. We're just going to count the 100, and then we're going to subtract that from your 794. So in my example, I had to pick a number I couldn't do in my head. Let's say that the child's check is $510, $520. That, that I can do in my head. So they get the 520 on the parent's check, and then we subtract the 20s disregarded. We subtract 500. And they told me I wouldn't have to do math when I became a lawyer. <laughs> I went to law school, so I wouldn't have to do math. And I have to figure out all these things. So you take the 500 off, and so now they'll still get $294 in SSI. So you still can get the two checks. What if the parent's check is $2,000? The kid gets 1,000, they lose the SSI. And that's okay, right? We don't need that 794, we're getting 1,000 over here. Well, people say, well, but, but that Medicare, or that, that, um, that SSI program comes with Medicaid healthcare coverage. Am I gonna lose that when I switch over to this other program? Short answer is no, you don't. You are in essence grandfathered into the SSI. Because you were on SSI before, you get Medicaid. It's called protected Medicaid. 98% of the Department of Children and Families caseworkers don't know what that is and how to apply that in the right circumstances. But you can still keep your Medicaid, even though you might lose your SSI check, if the reason you're losing it is because you became eligible to draw on a parent's work history. And here's the second to the last thing, or maybe the last thing I'm going to say about benefits. Because again, we could talk about this all day long, but I got a couple of the slides we want to talk about. When you become eligible to draw on a parent's work history through that disabled adult child benefit, after a 24-month waiting period, you become eligible for Medicare, the same Medicare that our retirees get. I heard you talk about it earlier. Um, so that Medicare that our 65-year-olds get, we can have a 20, basically a, a 20-year-old, because if your child, let's say, you know, at 18 or 20, starts drawing on your work history after 24 months of waiting, they can get Medicare as their primary health insurance. And in that case, they still may be eligible for Medicaid, but it falls into the background and becomes the supplement that a lot of our retirees get for their Medicare. So when our retirees retire at 65, they can be eligible for Medicare. That's the other thing they did. They screwed up all kinds of things. So it used to be 65, and it was easy. 65 is when you can draw Social Security. 65 is when you get Medicare. Well, not anymore. You can draw Social Security at 62, or you can wait until your retirement age at 68, or you can wait until 70. So all that's now changed. Medicare is still 65, 65, 65. So at 65, um, the parent, the, 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 you know, an elderly person has to usually buy a secondary policy because Medicare only covers 80% of most, most services. So you got the 20% that's not covered, so we buy this supplement. And in that case, Medicaid goes into the background to become a secondary one. So you can actually get combinations of all of these programs. So the, the first one is in the front, and the first one in the back. Oh, I'm sorry. I was pointing back there. She had her hand up. I'll come to you in a second. Uh, sorry. Yeah, so, so, so that's what I was referring to before. And I don't, uh, if you didn't hear it, I'm going to paraphrase. Remember what I said before that how do we know if a child is disabled? I you now know, you all know the legal definition of social, what Social Security says for disabled. They can't work. They can't make a certain amount of money. Well, they're, they're a child. They have to kind of guess or, or determine whether they think that's going to last into the future. Um, remember I said that there is a whole group of lawyers that all they do is make their living proving Social Security was wrong. So you can always, when Social Security says, we don't think you're disabled at any age, they can, you can appeal that. 
and, you, and it's a long process. The, 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 one of the best things about that is it never costs you a penny to do it. Social Security doesn't allow the lawyers to charge unless they, and what they do is they do get paid if they win. It's kind of like the commercials on TV, right? You see those lawyers that do that, sue people. So they, they take those cases on a contingency basis, right? So if, if you're injured in an accident, you know, we'll sue people. And when we collect money, they get paid some of the money that they collect. Well, with the Social Security benefits, they, the lawyers only get paid when they win the case and they go back and apply the benefits retroactively to when you should have got them and they want to give you a lump sum, they get a percentage of those retroactive benefits with a cap. There's a limit. Social Security regulates every little bit of it. And the thing is, in those cases, all those lawyers basically get paid the same exact amount of money. So you want to get the best lawyer you can get and hire them and see if they'll take the case. If they won't take the case, it's probably because they think that maybe Social Security was right. They are right sometimes. And so, um, and so they have a stake in it though, right? They're not gonna spend a bunch of time and their own money going after this if they don't think there's a decent case there. But if they do, they're gonna want it, right? Because that's how they make their living. And these cases, when they go through the appeals, can take years to happen. And then they can do this retroactive benefit, and then they get paid usually a quarter of that. So you get the rest of it anyway, and they get nothing of checks going forward. So now you're going to start getting this monthly check. They don't, you don't pay going forward. It's only the part that was wrongly denied. So short answer, a long answer to a short question is you hire a Social Security disability lawyer. Have them evaluate, even for a minor. There are lawyers that know how to do that and can look at it and see whether they think it's a good case. But even as the person gets older, you know, what, will it be more likely to be successful as they get older or not? I don't know. It just depends on whether they're getting better as they get older or whether they're staying at the same or whether they're, they're declining as they're getting older. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go right here. For, did you solve your question? Or? I answered it. Yay. Uh, in the back back there. Um, the question was, do you have to, uh, it, the answer should be, why do we have to wait two years for Medicare, not Social Security? There's no wait for the, yeah, there's a 24 month waiting period before Medicare kicks in when a person, um, it also is the same if, if I become disabled today and I can't work anymore and I apply for Social Security and start drawing my Social Security, I have to wait 24 months for my Medicare to kick in. Um, I don't know for certain the answer, um, that's what the law is. The general answer, I think though, is that when this program came in, everybody had health insurance because all your employers provided it. And there was a thing called COBRA that allowed you to keep your health insurance even when you stopped working, so you were still covered during that 24 month period. But I don't, but as many things when they came in at one time, they don't apply anymore. And it's, and it's a shame um, because you know, life evolved differently and we need to go back and revisit it. And that's something I know that's on the agenda in Washington for them to address. I got two more questions, but then I got to keep going because I'm not going to get, I got, I got less than five minutes. So I got one in the back and then right here. Good questions though. Thank you. So if you're eligible for SSI in Florida, whether you get the full $794 or you get some number less than that because you're getting income from some other sources or parents' income is deeming, $1 of SSI in Florida gives you medical Medicaid coverage. I, I use the medical Medicaid because there's different Medicaids, right? There's long-term care Medicaid. There's the Medicaid waiver that many of you are probably familiar with that's handled through the agency for persons with disabilities. So the medical coverage of Medicaid continues as long as you become stay eligible for at least a dollar of SSI and exception and there's others but an exception to that rule is if you lose your SSI completely because you become eligible to draw on someone else's work history a parent or a spouse sometimes 
then you, you actually are grandfathered in to, so to, the, to the Medicaid through this protected Medicaid program, but you have to ask for it and you need to know it by name. If you ever have that as a question or an issue, just email me. I have a memo that I have prepared that explains all that directly to the Social Security worker, where it is in their rule book, where it is in the federal law, and all you have to do is just go, you're wrong, here it is. So, this, it, it, ha it happens so often. One more question here, and then I got a couple more slides I want to cover. It does not impact the primary workers' check themselves. Now, it might impact their spouse, because you know you can get Social Security on a spouse's work history, too. If you never worked, and your spouse worked, and they get retired, and you reach retirement age, you get Social Security then, too. You get half of their amount. So it can get diluted, but the primary worker, their benefit is not reduced at all. It does not affect the parents' work, the, the parents' check. And in fact, in that child situation, here's another thing that's interesting about it is the child gets they might the child could be eligible to draw on both parents, but he only get that he or she only gets one. So they but they get the largest one they're entitled to. So if both parents, let's say they worked the same exact amount and, and paid the same amount in taxes, so their social security checks are exactly the same, it doesn't really matter. But let's say, let's say that the figures are off by a little bit, and let's say that the, the, the mom retires, let's say the dad retires first, it starts triggering the check, the kid gets 50% of, of dad's check. Let's say mom kept working a little bit more, retired later, and her check's a little bit more. When she retires, the kid's check will go to 50% of, of mom's amount. And then when dad dies first, because we always do it seems like, but maybe not, the child's check goes to 75% of dad's figure, because that's more maybe than 50% of mom's. See, I told you math. They told me I wouldn't have to do math. But that goes to 75% of the, of the dad's amount, because that's more. And then when mom passes away, maybe, and 75% of hers is more. So this kid's check can keep bumping up. It's always the largest that they're entitled to, and it never affects the parent's check. Okay, got a couple more I wanted to talk about. I already mentioned some of these, though, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Guardianship and guardian advocacy. Here on this slide are some of those um, civil rights that can be impacted. The right to contract, the right to make your own medical decisions, apply for government benefits, determine where you're going to live. So like I mentioned before, you know, when that child turns 18, these rights as a parent we've been able to exercise many times for them. They now have... And we have to decide, is that going to be too risky? Is that person going to be vulnerable? Are they going to be able to, are they going to be taken advantage of? Are they going to be at risk? If so, we need to re-examine these and see if they need to be removed and given back to someone. And that's really what a guardianship is. And a guardian advocacy is a guardianship for a person with an intellectual or a developmental disability that fits into the statutory definition of that. You might have an intellectual or a developmental disability that isn't one of them that's on that list, so you sometimes have to go the other guardianship route, but this one is, um, um, yeah. and there's a whole program on that, so I'm not going to talk anymore about that. And then um, there was a whole program about this yesterday, so I just wanted to touch it because I've got like two minutes. Um, what about the money? You know, the old way maybe was, okay, I have this person I want to take care of, but they can't manage the money for one. And now I know that these programs out there, that they can't have maybe too much money in their name anyway, or they might lose them. So I'm just going to leave them out. I'm just going to give it to somebody else. And maybe that works. Um, I, don't, I see that rarely, but um, I'm sure it happens a lot. I usually get involved when it didn't work out too well, because what if there's some problems with the old-fashioned way is, what if that sibling or whoever doesn't do the right thing? Unfortunately, that happens. Um, what if they try to do the right thing, but something prevents them from doing it? What if they get sick? What if they get divorced? What if they get sued? And now this money they're holding for our other vulnerable family member is at risk. So, and, and there's also obviously an inherent conflict of interest. I've got this money that, that was given to me by mom and dad to use for my, my brother, but um, if I don't use it for him, I'm, it's going to be for me. Or it's going to maybe go to my kids. So there's a conflict. It's okay. I mean, we... Conflicts of interest are out there all the time. And maybe we say, I'm not worried about that. That's okay. So it, it can work, but really I think the, the accurate or the right answer is we put in a trust 
And we can still have that same person in charge of it, but if it's in a properly drafted trust, it's not at risk if they get sued or they get divorced or they die first because somebody else will be able to step in and take it over. Um, and so it's protected there. And that's really what a special needs trust is. It gets a little bit more complicated, a little bit more detailed than that. But um, there's a whole program. Again, Cole Long did that session yesterday, and he spent a whole hour just on special needs trusts. So I'm almost out of time. Um, I wanted to just finish with, um, with uh, there's actually whole programs on ABLE accounts. We could talk about that if we need to. I had one slide for it, but John Finch knows a whole lot more about that than I do, and he's the director of the ABLE program, and he's here. So go see him at his table. I have an ABLE account for my daughter. I opened it up. I opened it up on July 2nd. I did. I, they were started on July 1st. I took for whatever reason I was busy that day. And I opened her an account on July 2nd. I think they're wonderful. They work really well and can work in tandem and work uh, together with special needs trusts. Sometimes they can be an alternative. Other times they are a complement to it. Quick question. Yeah, yeah. what qualifies them? Yeah. Well, they have a medical person that reviews the chart who never actually sees the individual, so that's where having your medical records are, are really important, that you have really good, accurate medical records. But they, do a, they always do a disability determination without ever actually seeing the person. So that's why, um, that's why so about 40% of all initial disability claims are approved. This is brand new. This data just came out this last week. I, I was seeing it. 40% are approved on initial application. That's a lot more than most people think. But of those 40%, the 60% that, uh, the, the that are denied, um, you appeal them, and still a very large portion of them are approved once you go through the appeals process because they're not. Well, the short answer is the Social Security worker, him or herself, is not making the decision. It's being made by a, a, a doctor that they have that's reviewing it. So they're not always qualified. Last thing, and then I'm, I'm, I'm done with questions. You can come up to me if you want. But my last is I wanted to mention, so coordinating all of your finances with this is so important. So even if you were to do a trust, um, you've got to go back and, and look at beneficiary designations on things like life insurance and retirement accounts. You've got to retitle things. So it takes some work. Um, these trusts, if you do one, it's got to be funded. You've got to make sure that things are going to get in there when they need it, when they need to be in there, and it takes some follow through. And you usually you want to work in conjunction if you have a financial advisor or an accountant to help you with some of that stuff because that's one of the biggest things that I see, even for people who've already put together their plan, is they didn't quite finish following it through. They didn't go back and readdress their beneficiary designations and things like that realize that that paperwork that you fill out when you open an account or when you move money or you, you do your benefits with your work where you do your, you know, who's going to be your beneficiary, that's all so critical and it needs to be coordinated in with your estate plan. So with that, I'm out of time. I'll be up here for just a little bit because I think we've got a half hour till the next session. Um, and then we got a table over at the exhibit hall so you can come see me over there too. Thank you.